I'm a professor here in aerospace and ocean engineering. I got started working on the three body problem as an undergrad with JPL. I was just fascinated with how NASA designed space missions. And then uh, I learned about a particular mission called the Genesis Solar Wind Sample Return Mission and worked a little bit with the team that was doing that in the early 2000s. And I've done some other things with the three body problem that maybe could be surprising to you if you haven't seen the solutions. They're quite different than the usual two body problem. And we view them in a different way. I'm showing an inertial frame projection of the, we've got the sun, Jupiter's orbit and a comet. This is comet Oterma during a few decades from 1910 to 1980. And you see it had a close encounter with Jupiter, went inside Jupiter's orbit and then left. So we did this sort of free, really interesting transfer from outside of a planet's orbit, inside a planet's orbit via a close encounter. And if you were to look at the semi-major axis versus time, right, this defies two body problem stuff. What's going on here? It goes from a high semi-major axis. What's this weird peak? Goes down to something low. These peaks, this means that it doesn't even make sense to look at a two body problem with respect to the sun. Once you get close enough to Jupiter, you're kind of under the influence of Jupiter. And there's this little bit of time where maybe you're under the influence of both. So now I'm showing simultaneously the same trajectory that's in the inertial frame, but viewed now in a, a frame that's co-rotating with Jupiter. So Jupiter's over here on the positive side of the x-axis, and then we've got the sun. And so you can see what Jupiter is doing. It's coming really close, basically, to these Lagrange points. And maybe you've heard something about the Lagrange points. I'll say some more today. But it was studying this comet that kind of got me interested. There's a few comets that are like this, and some of them are so chaotic, um, you can't even predict them. In fact, this one, depending on the initial conditions you start with in 1980 and which full model you use, you don't actually get this behavior, which is, this is what the comet actually did. You get, you get something else, like it, it doesn't actually ever enter the realm around the sun. So you've seen the three body problem, point P in the field of two bodies. I'm just gonna be looking at the planar circular restricted three body problem. That means we're looking, everything's in the plane. You got the two massive bodies moving about their common center of mass, the very center. And instead of looking in the inertial frame, it actually simplifies the analysis of the equations to jump into a frame that's co-orbiting. So we usually look in this rotating frame and I'll use little x and little y. I'll, I'll mostly be using non-dimensional uh, coordinates. So the motion of the, the particle, the comet, or the, the spacecraft is moving in a, an effective potential that looks like this, it takes into account the gravity of both masses, but also the centripetal force. But we also have a Coriolis force being in the rotating frame. Maybe you've seen the equations of motion. This is one way to write it. It sort of shows that we've got this, these Coriolis terms, and then we're taking the negative gradient of an effective potential. And this conserves an energy integral, which is related to the Jacobi constant, which maybe you've heard of. Here, this energy is, um, I think, negative one half of the traditional definition of the Jacobi constant, which goes back to Jacobi, you know, when Jacobi. So depending on the value of that energy is, and this energy isn't just like the usual Keplerian energy. It's, um, it's something weird, but for a particular value of uh, the, the energy. And so I'm showing like a spacecraft in the earth moon system. As you increase the energy, these little gateways open up around the Lagrange point. So this is the L1 in the Earth Moon system. And sometimes I'll refer to things called realms, which means like the large region around the Earth would be the Earth realm. It includes all of the phase space. And then there'd be the Moon realm. And then they're connected to sort of a bottleneck region around L1. But as you change energy, right, at the very lowest energies, you're either entirely in an orbit around uh, the first mass, the larger mass, or entirely in orbit around the second mass. And then this is where Keplerian orbits would, would dominate. And you don't even worry about three body effects, right? As you increase energy, these things are sort of opening up. So L1 is the first one that opens up. And what I mean is the energy connectivity opens up. The thing in gray is energetically inaccessible. The boundary of it is called a zero velocity curve because that's where the kinetic energy goes to zero. Gray is where there'd be negative kinetic energy. So it's just not physically possible. So as you increase the energy further, we get to this situation where now L2, it opens up 
And then at some point, L3 opens up, and at some point, there's just no forbidden region anymore. So technically, the particle could be anywhere in the plane, although there's invisible structures that you can't see in phase space that might be governing what's going on. So this is, at least for a pretty large value vet mass ratio, it's really large, 0.3. You can see the Lagrange point. And I'm using a convention that's probably different from your textbook. Some textbooks flip everything around. NASA uses this. So remember this one, if you want to work for NASA. They say L1 is the point between the two, and then L2 is on the other side. I won't really say much about L3, L4, and L5. I'm really going to focus on L1 and L2 because they have some special role in terms of determining how trajectories get to and from the smaller mass. And again, this is that effective potential energy, and the critical points are what give rise to these Lagrange points. And for most values of the mass parameter, L4 and L5 are stable. Um, there is after you get to a large enough uh, mass ratio, they actually become unstable. But for most mass ratios found in the solar system, they're, they're stable, meaning something that starts around it will actually stay around it. And maybe you've heard of the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. These are asteroids that are just sort of swirling around. We even recently sent a mission to go study them. The ones around L4 are called the Trojan asteroids. And just to be cute, the ones around L5 are called the Greek asteroids. Lagrange has his name attached to the points, even though he only actually found L4 and L5. Euler, who was his mentor, found uh, L1, L2, and L3, but, you know, uh, he got to name them. The three-body problem's like a who's who. People have done mathematics and mechanics for the last 300 years, because it's an old problem. Newton um, kind of gave up because he said it's unsolvable. And yeah, it technically still is unsolvable, but you know, it kind of depends on what you mean by solved. We have a much better idea now of what the trajectories in the three-body problem are. So if you, I like to give this an analogy. I don't know if you've seen these funnels where you sort of drop a coin and it spirals in, and that's a lot like the gravity well of a large object, say like the earth. So things could be orbiting around the earth, but what if you add in the moon? Now you've got another little you know, dimple in this uh, surface. And it just so happens that because of the rotation as well, being in a rotating frame, there are two points of balance on either side of the smaller mass. So you have an L1 and an L2. L1 kind of makes sense. You can kind of see this like, yeah, I can see where there might be a point that's um, an equilibrium between two masses. I don't get what L2 is about, whatever, but hey, it's there. Um, it has to do with the, the uh, rotational forces as well. And not only are those equilibrium points, uh, but they're unstable equilibrium points, which makes people think, oh, it's unstable. Everything leaves. No. Um, you can have orbits. They're unstable orbits, but they're there. They're unstable, but for typical missions, like in the Earth-Moon system, these orbits are about uh, half a lunar orbit. So they're about 14 days. And it's a large enough time scale that you could do trajectory correction maneuvers and stay on one of these orbits. So if we uh, look at the Sun-Jupiter system, just, you know, Jupiter's big, and I like Jupiter. Um, Poincaré in the late 1800s was one of the first to try to tackle the three-body problem. And basically develop what we now call chaos theory. Long before there were computers, he was doing some interesting geometric analyses and was able to demonstrate the existence of chaos in, in the three-body problem. Lyapunov, who was a, a, a Russian mathematician and mechanician, uh, discovered that there were these unstable periodic orbits, which now bear his name, Lyapunov orbits, and that exist in the plane of the two massive bodies. So these are places where you could have an unstable orbit and they exist both around L1 and L2. We've now found that in three dimensions, you could have other things called halo orbits because if you're standing at the planet and look back at the sun, it looks like the orbit's forming a halo around the sun. So remember the term halo. Um, in the 1960s, when, the, uh, when there was a lot of interest in space and trying to get to the moon, um, Two mathematicians, uh, Charles Conley and his student, Richard McGeehy, developed uh, some theories that said that these periodic orbits, being unstable, have actually entire tubes of trajectories winding off of them. 
And on the other hand, they also have tubes of trajectories winding onto them. So that's what I'm sort of schematically showing here. This is a blue tube that's sort of winding onto an L2 orbit and then a red tube of trajectories coming off. So these are now sometimes called Conley McGehee tubes. And they, because computers were sort of hard to come by, you know, something with punch cards, I've never seen it, I didn't grow up with that. They did some theory and suggested uh, ways to get to the moon cheaply, but then it sort of got forgotten for a few decades. And when I say that these are tubes, they're actually tubes that are made up of individual trajectories. So imagine you know, a, a basket that's made up of individual fibers. So here the fibers are trajectories and they're all either winding onto or winding off of an orbit. So you could have trajectories that are say on one of the tubes. So this would be, I'm just showing schematically something that's winding off of the L1 periodic orbit and passing by Jupiter and going through this L2 uh, tube. You could have trajectories that are on both tubes. These are called heteroclinic. Uh, just a fancy word that means it goes uh, from one thing to another and it doesn't use any fuel at all. Like I'm not saying do a delta V and you get from one place to another. No, this just happens. They're very fragile. Like if you change the initial condition, you won't, you won't get this, but they do exist and they have been explored by mission designers both in Europe and here in the US. You could have trajectories that are inside a tube, actually inside the both tubes. And these are things that, so not being on the tube, being inside, they actually pass through. So these tubes sort of act like uh, tunnels in the phase space, not in physical space. I portray it in physical space, but you really have to imagine we're not looking at just the two dimensions of the physical space, but the other two dimensions of the velocity. And if you're inside the tube in that sense, then you can have things that sort of orbit the sun, orbit Jupiter and so on. What does that remind us of, at least conceptually, what some comets do? If you're outside the tubes, then let's say you're orbiting the sun and then you just sort of bounce back. So these are things that uh, if, if you're not inside the tube, you're just not gonna pass to this realm around the secondary mass. So I call this the primary mass, the bigger one, the secondary mass. So it's so these, these periodic orbits that are unstable and these tubes of trajectories winding onto and off of them seem to govern a lot about the types of trajectories that can even occur in, in the three body problem. And this is stuff that's been appreciated a lot in the past 25 years. So I wanna focus on um, actually looking at a few missions just to show you how this gets used. This is showing schematically the Sun-Earth Lagrange points, not to scale. We've got, the, we've got the Earth, the Moon, and then four times the distance of, of the Moon. You've got L1 in the direction of the Sun and then L2 opposite that. But then you know, we also have Lagrange points in the Earth-Moon system. There might even be interesting connections between Lagrange points of the two systems. So let's first look at uh, L2. And this one has been in the news because of the James Webb telescope, right? The James Webb telescope just got launched um, and it's gonna be this next generation awesome thing that can see more than Hubble does. It's on an L2 orbit. So this little video just sort of schematically shows it's on a, one of the three-dimensional orbits, so a, a halo orbit. And it looks like it's a closed curve only if you view it in the, the, uh, Earth, um, the Sun-Earth rotating frame. In the inertial frame, it looks like some kind of crazy thing that's not following Kepler's law around the Sun. So there's no way you would use semi-major axis and eccentricity to describe this. You'd get like undefined numbers pull your hair out, go crazy. So just to give you an idea of how these orbits can be used, this is a, a video um, made by JPL. This is showing the, the L2 halo orbit and just sort of a sort of a starting orbit around the earth. There's the moon. What you'll see coming out of this halo orbit is one of these tubes of trajectories. And if you pick the right size halo orbit, its tubes will naturally intersect a, a low earth orbit which means you do a delta V, you get on this tube, and then once you're on that tube, you'll naturally wind onto final orbit. So that's how things like the James Webb uh, Space Telescope transfer were designed. Um, it's become a standard tool. Those are called 
invariant manifolds. The term space manifolds has been thrown around, although. So let's look at L1 now. This is related to the mission that I worked on somewhat called the Genesis mission. So again, not to scale, but you know, L1 is a million miles in the direction of the sun. 1.5 million kilometers, if you prefer. And this, this shows the different stages of the trajectory. What's really cool about the Genesis mission is it was, it was gonna be the first sample return mission, robotic sample return mission, partly because it didn't have to land on any kind of celestial body. It was just going to go out to the, an orbit at L1 where it had a clear view of the sun. All right, so why does it want that? I want a clear view of the sun because the goal here was to sample the solar wind. Um, and the trajectory shown here, it has different phases. Green is the sort of transfer from the low Earth orbit to the final halo orbit, where it would do four revolutions. And each revolution is about six months. These orbits are all typically half the orbital period of the two major bodies. So this is going to be half a year. We did four of them, so it was about two years of sampling. And then it came back on this blue trajectory, which you might think, why is it so circuitous and bizarre? The goal was to get to the sun side. And you can't really see it here, but this is the only way to get to the sun side of the Earth so that we could do the sample return. So it, it's interesting in that it was, it was going to be the first sample return. It was the first one designed using these invariant manifold techniques or new dynamical system techniques. This just shows sort of the solar a solar flare and then the uh, Earth's magnetic field is, you know, the camera shaking. Oh no, what's going on? L1 is beyond the Earth's magnetosphere, and that was important. Otherwise, the solar wind would get deflected around it. So you actually had to go that far away. So L1 was like a perfect choice for the science team. Pick a place that's where you have an unobstructed view of the sun, you can communicate with Earth. Um, I guess something I didn't say is uh, what the delta V was. We'll get to that. So this is just repeats what I said, gather solar wind. And it was gonna gather it in those bicycle wheel uh, size things. And then it, was, it needed to return specifically to Utah, like a certain part of Utah in the daytime where it was going to deploy a parachute and then be captured by a um, helicopter, which the US government for what reasons unknown to me has done this hundreds of times. And so they said, oh yeah, we have a whole system. We, we do this. Uh, it was very energy efficient. So here's the spacecraft once it was fully out there sampling. So it opens up this sort of pod cover. These samplers are about a bicycle tire size of aerogel. And the solar wind is just a bunch of um, highly energetic particles, subatomic particles. They're going to embed into the aerogel and then they're really fragile. So from the trajectory and also the particle itself, um, you could find out a lot of things about solar physics. And that was sort of the goal of this mission. And when it came back, this thing seals up and this sort of a, a pod that kind of looks like a hamburger was going to uh, was land in Utah and then get snatched by a helicopter. I mean, it sounds like something out of Mission Impossible. The final trajectory did involve not just the three body problem, but um, it used what's called the full ephemeris. So it used the, you know, all the masses of all the planets and their actual orbits, but it looks a lot like what you would have gotten in a really simple, just three body problem model. So you usually start with the simplest model to conceptually find these things. And then you do what's called a differential correction or a continuation method and find a, a similar solution in the full ephemeris model. So this is showing the trajectory. It uses no fuel once you leave earth. You could have just taken out the thrusters and everything. It uses absolutely no fuel. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's just, so this is a solution of the three body problem. And so you go, wow, this looks crazy. And yeah, it does. It doesn't look anything like what we're used to seeing in an inertial frame where you have a nice ellipse and yada, yada. It's weird stuff. And so you, you kind of need a whole new set of tools to even study the three body problem. It's hard to even scratch the surface in a talk like this. So it launched in 2001, and before the launch, the role I had was working on computing the optimal trajectory correction maneuvers. So I, I don't know if you know how uh, rockets work, but rockets uh, send things into space and they use a lot of fuel to do it. 
sometimes they're not so precise in the actual delta V that they impart. So rockets are sort of rated by their, their typical error. And this was a class of missions that didn't use the most precise rockets. So we ex expected there's going to be some kind of trajectory correction. Because even if you're off by 1%, that would that'll totally mess up the trajectory. And so you have to correct to get back on track. So we wanted to find out what are the optimal maneuvers, you know, when and where do we do these rocket burns to get back on track? Because we had to get exactly onto a particular halo orbit. So what I want you to imagine is there's some halo orbit out there and there's some kind of virtual thing. The way we viewed it is a hunting an analogy, the hound chasing the rabbit. The rabbit is on the halo orbit and we're the hound and we want to find that rabbit. So we developed a method to get optimal trajectory correction maneuvers. This video shows the red is the rabbit. That's the halo orbit we're trying to get onto and blue is our trajectory and then we get onto it. You don't even see what the trajectory correction maneuvers are here. We used some optimization procedure and found that um, given what was expected for the rocket, we could easily do it and everything would be fine. Fortunately, the rocket, because it's just a matter of probability, had a very low error. And so very few correction maneuvers are even needed. So the trajectory went flawlessly. Uh, just to give you an idea of the sensitivity with respect to initial conditions in this sort of regime, Here's that Genesis halo orbit going around the Earth uh, Lagrange point one. And what we're showing are various trajectories that are coming off of this and what they do. So just by changing the timing by one day of a little burn to just sort of get onto one of those tubes that's winding off, uh, you could see that small things Amp get amplified quite a bit. And then they're tens of thousands of kilometers apart after a little while. And what do these trajectories do? Well, they, they do crazy stuff. Some get perturbed by the moon. Some just seem to escape and leave and they never come back, which is not what you want for a sample return. And then there's some special one that does some weird giant loop and then comes back to the daytime side of the earth. So through tweaking and application of Newton's methods and things, we're, we're able to find ways that to get back to the Earth in the daytime side. That's exactly what we want. And it did. So the trajectory design went flawlessly. September 8th, 2004 was a big day. The, um, the capsule uh, comes back to Earth. It's going to hit this ellipse, pretty tiny ellipse in the Utah desert. Helicopter's ready. And this is not a photograph from that day. Things did not go well that day. This is what happened. The parachute didn't deploy. So we have this giant hamburger sized thing uh, coming in, terminal velocity. It, it you know, hits the Utah desert. It's monster truck force. Oh, these poor aerogels are all probably broken. Science is hopelessly lost. No, I mean, it looks bad, but they were actually able to get something out of this. You might be wondering, how did this happen? Well, somebody, I don't know where they were from, put the uh, trigger for the parachute in backwards. And so, you know, $150 million mission, you know, thanks. I mean, I don't know if heads rolled or anything. They just go, oh, you know, it happens. So, but they were, they had this as a backup plan. So there was some cushioning and they were still able to get some science out of this, even though it wasn't gently brought back down to the ground, right? You might think, well, why didn't they just do the parachute? What was the helicopter for? The helicopter was because the, a parachute landing was too fast. They wanted the helicopter to make this so that it's just brought down to the ground and then people like grab it and then, you know, they've got all the clean room stuff and they take it away. Okay, so that was L1. I want to look again at L2 and actually it's connections with the Earth Moon L1. So this was something that we discovered that there were these natural dynamical connections between these two three body problems. Right now we're talking not about a solution in the uh, three body problem, but a solution in the four body problem. What are the four bodies? You got the spacecraft in the field of the sun, earth, and moon. But you can actually decompose that into two, three body problems. So maybe you've seen how interplanetary missions, even though N bodies are involved, you could break it up into two bodies at a time. And that's called the patched conics approach. So we would call this the patched three body approach. And we say it's leaps and bounds greater than the patched conics. 
it ends up being a really good approximation for almost any mission that you'd want to do. There is a, a lunar gateway station. We had a proposal for a lunar L1 gateway station. I'm not sure if that's where they're going to put the gateway station, but that's what we thought would be a, a really good place because even though it's unstable and if you don't do anything, it drifts off into space forever. If you do a little bit of control every now and then, you know, it isn't lost forever. And this isn't too different from the ISS. If you don't do anything, the ISS is going to get hit by something or burn up. It has to do, you know, some burns every now and then to stay on its orbit. And so that's not, that's not too bad. And the energy requirements to keep this in orbit wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad. But what we were looking at is connections between the Earth Moon system and then the Sun Earth system, especially through these Lagrange points. This is just schematically showing that that same L2 and L2 orbit as the James Webb Space Telescope. If you have tra the trajectories that are winding onto it, this is what they would look like. It's in the form of lattice. So if you're actually on this tube, then you will get exactly onto this trajectory. If you're inside the tube, that's this blue trajectory, you sort of go past L2 and then you just sort of drift off into space forever. The red trajectory is outside the tube. It kind of comes here and then it bounces back, which you might think, what would the point of that be? It can end up being quite useful because this bending changes the trajectory so that if it intercepts the Earth moon L1 or L2, it'll actually get kind of captured around the moon. You can even do transfers from an L2 orbit in the sun earth system to an L1 orbit in the earth moon system. And we ended up calling this tube hopping. And this just schematically shows what's going on. You've got these sort of tubes sweeping through space and you're not really doing a delta V to jump from one to the other. They're actually naturally connected, <coughs> but that's hard to depict. And you know, this looks pretty cool anyway. So we had an idea for servicing missions like the space, the James Webb Space Telescope. Suppose we had to service that. You know, the Hubble Space Telescope required human servicing. If you need human servicing or robotic servicing, um, maybe you need to bring things back for repairs. A gateway station near the moon would be ideal. So this is showing um, the we've got the moon. We call this lunar L1, lunar L2. If we had a, a spacecraft at the lunar L1, and then we've got something that leaves the lunar L1 to go to, you know, visit the visit the, uh, the the James Webb Space Telescope. How would that happen? Well, you would do some kind of delta V that takes you off of the lunar L1 orbit to leave that space station. So maybe this is sort of a smaller craft, and then it goes from tube to tube. And now we're on this sort of big exterior tube, the exterior to the moon's orbit, and it'll eventually intersect and get on in a trajectory to the Earth L2. And then some servicing could happen. Maybe you recover some, some parts or replace parts. Uh, maybe this is done robotically. And this, these transfers actually take quite a bit of time. So we're talking months. So this would have to be a robotic uh, mission, but then bringing back maybe for you know, human uh, servicing back at the the gateway station. And then you just sort of bring things back. And, you know, don't, don't put too much credence in the actual tubes here. This is just a schematic. Uh, it does give you a good idea that then this thing could come back and then astronauts fix it and send it back out. So here's a trajectory, an actual trajectory that we designed to do that. So we've got sort of zooming in on, on, on the moon. If we started at a gateway station and then departed on a some robotic craft, so this had a delta V of 14 meters per second, and you see what happens. It sort of left, went kind of around the moon, and then left through this L2 gateway. As seen in the Sun-Earth rotating frame, this is, this is what it looks like. This is sped up uh, much more, but you see it leaves in such a way that now it's going into an orbit around L2. This is the only delta V present. So you get these kinds of trajectory, uh, these transfer trajectories for free. You just have to find them. It's like a needle in a very large phase space haystack, but you can find them. There's also possibilities of going to the moon. Let's go and go to the moon. Let's go to the moon. And this is not very intuitive, but you can get trajectories that go from Earth orbit to a moon orbit, not using a home and transfer, and it uses 20% less fuel by going out much farther. Um, 
So this is what it looks like in both frames. Maybe look at the inertial frame first. You go out much farther to the point where the sun's perturbation affects you, then you actually get onto an orbit that gets uh, captured by the moon. And so this, again, had you no delta V. After the first uh, escape from the Earth uh, uh, forward orbit, this is a natural trajectory in the four-body problem. I think it makes more sense to see it in the rotating frame of the Sun-Earth system. What we're doing is the, the Sun-Earth L2 is over here. We're sort of getting bounced back from an L2 orbit. And then this is phased just right to get captured by. So we, uh, we call this the shoot the moon trajectory. You probably saw how many times the moon went around. So it's, it takes many months, right? Home and transfer takes a few days, uh, but it's expensive. This thing takes a few months, um, but in some sense it's free. So yeah, you wouldn't want to use this for a human mission, but a robotic mission or say a uh, supply chain with some kind of steady stream of these things coming and delivering things. These are the ways to get to the moon. This is another one where you start at geo. And then um, this is in the rotating frame, which sort of reveals structure that isn't otherwise present. It, you know, things don't look like ellipses. You get these weird star patterns. What's going on? This is getting phased just so that it'll finally get captured around the moon. And then got a bit of free capture. So this just after leaving it, there's only one delta V and it's leaving geo. So there's other possibilities. This is just sort of an artist's picture of the tubes through space. And Jupiter is an interesting target because of its multiple moons. Right? The Jupiter moons, especially uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are thought to be icy moons. So they're a target for future exploration because you know who knows what's um, under that ice. So Jupiter's moons, Io, people like Io because it's got volcanoes, but eh, I like ice more than volcanoes. Um, so this is just sort of an artist's picture of what maybe the surface of Europa looks like. You've got these, these moons, and you know, they're pretty large. They're larger than our, our moon. Um, Europa's the closest, and then we got Ganymede, Callisto. If you look at the, uh, one of the moons, it's thought that they have, especially Europa, it's thought to have under its ice perhaps a 60 mile deep liquid water ocean. So it's kind of like the earth, you know, the earth has liquid um, lava, right, Mant mantle. Their mantle is water. Um, and so who knows what's down there? So eventually one day, I think we will send something that you know, finds a weak spot in the ice, drills down, explores the ocean, somehow transmitting back to earth. And this will just be so cool. And uh, you know we don't know what we'll see. Geothermal jets. Maybe it'll be some something alive. Uh, NASA seems to think wherever there's water, there's life. So we designed a multi-moon orbiter, a trajectory that was a solution of the five-body problem. So it's Jupiter, and Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So we were able to decompose and, and space craft. Those are the five bodies. We decompose that five-body problem into multiple three-body problems, and then use our patch three-body approach. The patch three body approach is conceptually is you want to sort of do these sort of loose orbits around each body and then you escape on uh, the unstable directions or the wind off tubes which intersect the attracting tubes and you go to other moons and you know maybe eventually you want to plunge into Jupiter. This is how Galileo ended its life and it's a good way to go. You know if you crash into one of the moons yeah, if there's life there, we've poisoned it or something. Whereas if you plunge into Jupiter, nobody cares what's happening in the interior of Jupiter. Like we just send all our junk to Jupiter, uh, burn it up. But, I mean, once you get down enough, you, you implode and nobody cares. We did this. this again, this is a schematic. Um, we wanted to design something that did visit some, we started with just two moons. So say, can we do a flyby of Ganymede? So first, Coming from Earth, you, you get onto a large orbit. Say you do a flyby of Jupiter. Now you're on a large orbit around Jupiter. From that large orbit, can you then get uh, a flyby of Ganymede and then use these methods to get into uh, uh, an orbit around Europa? So this shows a trajectory actually in three dimensions. I think that's Jupiter to scale. We do a pretty large delta V at some point. 
which later we could uh, drop. But after the delta V, then you get transferred onto an orbit that takes you to Europa. And this is what it looks like at Europa in a rotating frame. And I'm like, I don't know what the a, a, uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity is for this. It looks weird. Now, of course, if you wanted to get captured on a high inclination orbit around Europa, yeah, you do have to do an, another delta V here. If not, this thing would uh, do some other things. But with very little fuel, you could just sort of be on one of these large corkscrewing orbits taking imaging. We later found uh, an actual solution to the five body problem. So this visits all of the icy moons and it uses no fuel. So this is a natural trajectory of the five body problem. Of course, you have to pick the date right and uh, so that the moons are phased correctly, but look how weird this is. Hopefully I've given you an idea that the, the three body problem, it's not just about the Lagrange points and Lagrange point orbits, although those are interesting. There's also all kinds of other possibilities, especially if you're willing to uh, trade time for fuel. If you want to save on fuel, these are good methods to use. So we revealed that there's many trajectories. The techniques involved can kind of get you into a lot of applied math, like differential equations, chaos theory. There's a lot to it. If only there was a book that covered these things, you know? So there it is. We wrote a book. Um, me and my uh, PhD advisor and a guy from JPL and another colleague from Caltech, we wrote a book and we just made it free because we knew, you know, there's like 20 people who care. So we're not going to make a lot of money if we turn this into one of those yellow books that nobody likes. So it's just a free PDF. If you want, you could, uh, you could download it. Um, I have taught a class on this a couple of times. I don't know if I'll teach one anytime soon, but, you know, that could be, if there was interest. We could teach techniques on uh, dynamical systems of three body problem and space mission design. And that's it. I do post a lot of things on YouTube. There's a lot of videos and also on uh, Twitter. So if you, if you, if you do want to learn more, there's a lot of material available and I could also point you to it. Um, but that's it. Thanks.